Hello, Kidney Warriors. James here from Dadvice TV, and this is Dadvice TV Live. Hold on one second. I got some birds in the background. Let me <laughs> mute those. Um, if you're new here, go ahead and say new in the comments. Like Jeff here, he's relatively new. Hey, Jeff, great to have you here during the live show. Um, and if you are new, my name's James. I'm not a doctor, I'm a kidney patient. I'm the host of Dadvice TV but we do have a doctor here. But let me give you a quick little rundown of kind of my qualifications as a kidney patient. I was diagnosed just over two years ago with stage five kidney failure with a single digit GFR. Doctors got it up to GFR 13, said, hey James, you need to go on dialysis. That's as good as you're gonna get. Well, they were wrong. I never went on dialysis. I never got a transplant. Luckily, and there is some luck involved, I was able to make diet and lifestyle changes and improve my overall health and my labs for my kidneys. I'm currently what is considered stage three, right on the border of stage three and stage four, but more importantly, I feel great and I do not have a single symptom. There is nothing holding me back from kicking kidney disease to the curb. Now tonight, Back with us, one of your guys' favorite guests here on Dadvice TV. He is the author of Learn the Facts About Kidney Disease, a great book. If I was to write a book, and a lot of people say, hey, James, you should write a book. I don't need to write a book. This is exactly what I would say, what's in his book. But let's welcome Dr. Rosansky. Hey, doctor, how you doing? I'm good, James. Merry Christmas to everyone, and Happy New Year. Oh, yeah. Now let the new people know a little bit about you and your background. <clears throat> so I am a retired kidney specialist. I went to medical school in 68 to 72. Um, I am an internist first and then a kidney specialist second. Um, I started a kidney program in Columbia, South Carolina. I've taken care of thousands of kidney patients. I've also done a good bit of research with over 100 publications. And I wrote this book, uh, that you can see there, learn the facts about kidney disease, because I realized that there's a lot of confusion, fear, misinformation about kidney disease, and especially about the issue of when is the best time to start dialysis. So, um, and I got lucky to uh, find James, and I've been uh, having fun trying to help oh, yeah. people learn more about the kidney problems. Exactly, and, and what I love most about your <laughs> advice, not only does it come from a professional, you've been doing this for so long, but it's, it's not that doom and gloom that we see when we usually go online, especially the big kidney sites that are so focused on dialysis and transplant. And they kind of almost present kidney disease as in, hey, you got it now? Here's where you're gonna be. Let's talk about where, you, where you're gonna be. And we're not all gonna get there. And your book talks about that. And I just love your approach. But for today's topic, um, I asked Dr. Rosansky, Dr. Rowe for short, to talk about the stages of kidney disease and GFR and some other related topics. Because when I go out on the internet and I'm in a lot of message forums, whether they're Facebook groups, <clears throat> um, some of the big kidney groups um, or on Reddit, I see a lot of people that are like I was they're diagnosed, they're confused, they're concerned, and there's a lot of worry, even if it's someone who's, you know, you know, got many years of experience. You know, I had one, uh, a person in their 80s, early 80s, with a GFR, it was either 48 or 49, and she reached out and she wanted to know, is her life over? And it almost feels that way as a kidney patient. We go online, we start searching, and it is kind of geared towards that negative, hey, your life's over, you're gonna end up on dialysis, start preparing, but that's not the reality. So I wanted to let you talk about the reality so we can take some of that burden, some of that worry off of our shoulders. James, I'm gonna start out uh, by doing two things. I'm gonna answer Deb Duff's uh, question, which I think is excellent. It's a good entree into today's discussion. Before I do that, I want all of you folks, especially folks with kidney disease, um, if you have uh, certainly 
uh, stage four or even stage three kidney disease, you've got high blood pressure diabetes, please do not hesitate to take the COVID vaccine. It is safe. It is. It will protect you from getting serious illness or potentially dying. And I highly recommend all of you to take it. In our last discussion, I talked about a large study which showed that kidney patients are at very high risk of having bad outcomes from COVID and the risk increases with lower kidney function. So please get your vaccine when it's offered yeah. to you. And I will definitely, uh, as soon as it's available, I'll be getting mine. And if they let me, <laughs> I'm going to broadcast it. I'll record it, either stream it live on Facebook and YouTube, or at least get a, a video of it, if possible. They don't like me filming when I go in and get my laps or even taking pictures. But I'm definitely, no hesitation, I will be there getting it as soon as it's available because I look forward to going back to the way things used to be as much as possible. Yeah. So let's go right into Deb Duff. She said, my EGFR was 58 in January. <clears throat> Changed my diet a month ago. Is it possible for it to become 75 with diet or something else? And we're going to try to answer your question because this is a common, common situation. So first of all, we need to understand what is EGFR, what is creatinine, and how they all connect. Firstly, there's all kinds of stuff on the internet about, oh, I can get your creatinine down. I've got, this, I've got these healthy foods that are gonna get your creatinine down. This, A those, bottle of magic pills. Uh, magic pills, that is nonsense, nonsense, nonsense. What is creatinine, folks? Creatinine is just a byproduct of something that happens in muscle. In muscle, there's something called creatine, which there's a chemical reaction, puts a phosphate on it, which becomes creatine phosphate. And the waste product in this reaction is creatinine. It has no function. It is useless. Creatine phosphorus is the energy thing. Any of you who took biology probably heard of ATP. The P is the phosphorus. Phosphorus is what gives the muscle the energy capability. Has nothing to do with creatinine. Creatinine is just a waste product and it's a marker of glomerulofiltration. Let's talk about what is glomerulofiltration. So the kidney is a little filtering apparatus and the kidney has these glomeruli, which are these tiny units, millions of these tiny units that filter your blood. And that's what the glomerulofiltrate is. There is, there are markers like creatinine to tell how much is being filtered. And that's what your glomerulofiltration rate is. But there's a lot of confusion about that term and about what affects serum creatinine. Now, first of all, ideally to be a good measure of glomerulofiltration, something should only be filtered. But guess what? Creatinine is not ideal because some creatinine is actually put into the urine. It's secreted in there. And the way you know that creatinine is just a marker and it has nothing to do with anything w regarding your health is because if you happen to take some drugs that affect this secretion, your creatinine can change. There's so many things that can affect your creatinine. So for example, cooked meat has some creatinine. You eat a lot of cooked meat, that can affect your creatinine. High dietary protein can, your, can affect your creatinine. If you do intensive exercise, it can affect your creatinine. If you get dehydrated, it can affect your creatinine. Now, getting back to the question, there I was on one of the Facebook uh, sites that talk about diet, 
and I can't tell you how many people said, I went on a very low protein diet or an entirely plant-based diet, and I've been on it for X amount of time, and my kidney number changed. Well, guess what? It did not change because of your diet. If anything, it's just a false sense of a change. So let me just tell you how that works. So if you are eating a normal diet, and this kind of answers your question, if you eat a normal diet, then you go to a low protein diet, what can happen is you can generate less creatinine. And so your creatinine can change without having any change in your kidney function, just as a result of going, you know, cold turkey on protein and just going to very low protein. And the only way you would know that there's no change in your kidney function if you actually got a measured kidney function. So Deb, the EGFR is an estimated kidney function. That's, that's what the E is all about. It's an estimate. And why is it an estimate? Because to do a real kidney function, you need to know two things. You, don't, you need to know not only what that creatinine is, and basically your creatinine is pretty stable as long as your kidney function is not changing. You need to know the creatinine, but you also need to know something which we can't know unless we collect 24-hour urine. And that is how much creatinine are you putting in your pee in 24 hours. So there's two parts to that creatinine clearance. There's a numerator, which is the amount of creatinine totally that you're putting out in a day. And there's the denominator, which is your blood creatinine level. You go on a real low protein diet, it could change your creatinine, but guess what? And so that will increase. So again, if, if the creatinine is in a denominator, a lower number gives you a higher E G a GFR, that's the actual measure GFR. If you actually sent your urine to a lab, the numerator, the amount of creatinine you produced in a day, would be down. So it, it so even though so that would balance out the decline in the denominator, the de numerator would go down. So there would be no change in your kidney function. But that's why you need to really understand what creatinine is. It's just a measure of the amount of muscle mass is one thing. It's a measure, uh, it can also relate to the size of your body. And so when they do something called EGFR, it's a equation where they plug in your, your creatinine and they plug in numbers because with age, you get a different amount of creatinine produced. And race, uh, African Americans produce more creatinine per weight. So they have to adjust it and they produce the E, the estimate. So there's all kinds of things that can affect your creatinine that have nothing to do with your kidney function. And there's nothing you need to do to eat or to drink or whatever that to try to get that creatinine to change because it makes no sense. It has no meaning, it has no purpose. And understand that the EGFR is just an estimate and it's a useful estimate. It's a useful estimate as long as you're looking at repeated values over time. And, and uh, your number, uh, Deb, of 78 and, and any number above 60 is very unreliable. Once that EGFR number is above 60, it could be 65, it could be 75. So people that say, oh, I went on a low protein diet and or I did this woo woo stuff and now I went from 70 to 65 or 75 to 60. And is that real? Well, may or may not be. And you just need a lot of um, lab data to see what your trend is over time. And so I would say it's unlikely that your recent diet had any real effect on your kidney function. Is, is a plant-based diet useful? Yes, but it's not useful because it's going to give you kidney function that's going to be, you know, going from 40 to 80. That's not why you're doing it.
you're doing the plant-based diet, and James knows this very well, because most people with kidney disease, they don't die of kidney failure. Right. Most people with kidney disease have a higher risk, and not everybody, and we're gonna to get to that, because some, some stages of kidney disease don't really give you that higher risk of getting heart disease, having strokes, having heart attacks, having the complications of hardening of the arteries. So the main thing you need to do if you've got a decrease in your kidney number, EGFR, is to lower your risk of getting atherosclerotic heart disease and the complications of, um, of, of, of having uh, vascular disease or atherosclerosis. That's the main thing you're doing. You're trying to decrease your risk factors and plant-based diet is a great thing to do. It may, it may, have an effect over years, not weeks or days. No way it's gonna affect you in days or weeks or even months. It may have an effect over years. I'm talking about five or 10 years of a plant-based diet could potentially slow the decline. Don't look for changes in weeks, days, or months. That, that's, yeah. that's nonsense, doesn't, and doesn't, it kinda doesn't work. Touch on Go one ahead. thing you were mentioning earlier, when we, as a kidney patient, when I was first diagnosed, everything I looked at was about your creatinine, creatinine, creatinine. So I believed incorrectly creatinine was bad. And the goal was lower creatinine and things got better. And my original doctor kept saying, no, focus on your health. You need to drop weight. You need to become more active. You need to eat healthier. And he kept saying, here's how you improve your 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 kidney outcome live healthy that's it live healthy do that things will get better for you or it sets me up at least for the best chance for things to get better so so let me kind of give you a another term which you may see in the next five or ten years there's been a big push to stop talking about creatinine as the measure of kidney function there's another <clears throat> thing that's in your blood like creatinine <clears throat> it's just a bystander, not anything that has any real meaning. It's called cystatin C. There's a, people that are pushing the cystatin C measure of each estimated GFR. Why? Because it's not affected by muscle. If you are a person that has lots of muscle because you're a bodybuilder, little muscle because you're old and your muscle mass is, is declining, uh, or you're sick, these equations are not useful. They're not going to give you an accurate determination. So there's other things besides creatinine that could give you the estimate of your kidney function. The estimate of your kidney function in the equation, it adjusts for your age, as we said, adjusts for your race, because different amounts of creatinine are produced depending upon your age and your race. Um, and um, the thing about the estimated, I'll just make one other point about estimated versus actual. So again, the actual measured kidney function has to be done with 24 hour urine. And you and you have the amount of the numerators, the amount of creatinine you produce in 24 hours, the denominator is your blood creatinine level. Now, in some cases, patients are going to have a big difference between that estimated number that you get from the lab when you get a blood test, and if you ever do a 24-hour urine. And what this is showing you is if the estimated number is lower than the actual number, it probably means that you have less muscle mass. And for any given age and any given situation, if you're an individual, especially as you get older, that has more muscle mass, versus an individual of the same age that has less muscle mass. And if you happen to have a higher creatinine, which you probably would, because you have more muscle mass, guess what? You're healthier. Even though the equation may give you a lower kidney function number. So don't get hung up on the kidney function number. Don't get hung up on your creatinine. And especially don't get hung up with small changes over days, weeks, or months. You got to look at things over years. And creatinine, 
sorry, GFR, kidney function, is another factor that predicts bad outcomes, hardening of the arteries, heart attacks, strokes, uh, limb loss, decreased blood flow, congestive heart failure. Just like your cholesterol, your bad cholesterol, your LDL, higher LDL, also a, bad, a predictor of bad outcomes. Higher blood pressure, also a predictor of those bad outcomes. Smoking, all of these things, if you're not gonna address these things, and just getting hung up on creatinine or your GFR number, you're not doing yourself a favor. And that's why in my book, I spend a lot of time on a chapter talking about atherosclerosis, what you can do to decrease your risk of the complications of atherosclerosis. Because that's what the main deal is about the vast majority of people with stages of kidney disease, which are for the 90% of people are three, for, I'm sorry, stage one, two, three. I mean, it's probably 10% or less of the people that go on to four or five. And think about it. If it's, just, it's, if it's just such a small part of the overall people that get diagnosed with an abnormal kidney number that go on to stage four or five, you're probably not gonna be one of them. I mean, you might be, and we're gonna discuss the things that could uh, predict that for you. Yep, now Ray asked a great question. <laughs> Ray asks, what is a 24-hour urine besides a gigantic inconvenience and something you should only do on the weekend, not when you're going into work? Can you explain what that is to Ray? <clears throat> okay, well, it's done. I When I came up, if you wanted a kidney number, that's what you had to do. Um, I mean, we <laughs> we we had we didn't have these equations. I mean, we've, we've gone through a bunch of equations over the last 20, 30 years. But... The simple way to calculate your kidney number is you divide your, your creatinine by 100. Gives you a rough ballpark. And probably that's good enough today. So if your creatinine is 3, GFR 33, roughly. Creatinine 2, GFR you know 50 range, okay? Um, but 24-hour urine uh, was done to get an actual measured kidney function. And to get a measured kidney function, you need... The two pieces, the, the two pieces are the numerator, which is the total amount of creatinine that comes out in 24 hours, and they'll measure that in the jug, a 24-hour urine, and the denominator of this is the blood creatinine, the serum creatinine level. And the way you do it, and it you know, the way I tell my patients, if you're, asked to, if you're asked to do a 24-hour urine, what I do is say, get up in the morning, go to the bathroom, empty out your bladder. From the next 24 hours, all your urine goes in a jug, including the next morning, and then you're done. That's just if anybody's ever asked to do a 24-hour urine collection. Um, let me go to the stages, and I'm going yeah. to eliminate stage one and two very quickly, because stage one and two, by and large, is not kidney disease, but we're going to get into it in a minute. So. Let's talk about stage 3A. Stage 3A is, and, and these are arbitrary things. And don't say, well, I went from stage 3A to 3B or stage 3 to 4. You know, the cutoffs are mainly for research. They're arbitrary. But the way things are today, 3A is 45 to 60, which is the vast majority of you folks. You're at 45 to 60. So, Here's something that I discussed a couple of weeks back. There was a very couple of big studies that looked at people with that range, 3A. And so why do you need to know about whether you've got, you know, a, a 45 or a 60 or a 55 or a 70? Is, is it going to predict that you're going to have a bad outcome? What are the bad outcomes? Kidney failure, extremely rare much more common are what we talked about, the complications of hardening of the arteries. And it turns out that when you got a patient with a 45 to 60 and you repeat it, and first of all, any number has to be repeated twice. Don't get hung up with one number. It needs at least two values of the same or less over three months. Don't take any one value to mean anything. 
So when they looked at people that had this, they found that there was not a predictive value of having a bad outcome for the vast majority of people in the 45 to 60 range. And the other thing that's important to know, so depending on your age, your kidney function number will be more or less worrisome. So let's say, for example, that you're less than 45. In my opinion, and the opinion of lot, lots of my colleagues, by the way, again, stage one and two uh, are um, kidney function number uh, of, stage one is over 90, stage two is 60 to 89. Most of us nephrologists say, this is not real kidney disease. Although, if you're under 45, and your number's less than 75, I would consider that abnormal. So if you're under 45 and your repeated kidney function number, again, over three months or more, is less than 75, it's worth keeping an eye on, okay? And we're gonna get into urine protein in a minute, which is more important than your kidney number. So under 45, if you're less than 40, 75, I would consider that something to watch and you may have an abnormal kidney number. If you're 45 to 65, less than 60, uh, I would say is an abnormal kidney number. And if you're over 65 or 70, probably 45 to 60, stage 3A is probably not kidney disease for most of you that are over 65, certainly over 70 or over 75. If you're over 75 or over 80, a 45 to 60 is probably not a kidney number to worry about. Again, 45 to 65, under 60, stop keeping an eye out for it. Under 45 and you're less than 75, keep an eye out on your kidney number and follow it up. And age is really, really important. And that's something that generally is not talked about with the stages. It's just... GFR, this, this, this are in these stages, but age is really, really important because over time our kidneys naturally decline. And at some point, even a, a GFR of 58, if you know, if at a certain age, that's still doing great. Yeah, yeah. I would say that if you're over 65 and you got a 58, I would not worry about it, okay? Now, and, and the reason is that after age 40, you're losing about 10 units every decade. You're losing about a unit a, a year after age 40. And, and, and by age 50, you've lost about half your, those, those, uh, those units of kidney function, the nephrons. By the way, nephron, nephrology, okay, that's where it all comes from. Yep. Um, so um, we're gonna get into symptoms a little later on. James wanted me to talk about symptoms, which we hadn't really discussed. But I would say this, if you're, if you're 3B, okay, 3A is 45 to 60. 3B is less than 45. If you're 3B, I would say you're less than 45. I would keep an eye on it, even for people that are over 65. If you are, if your kidney function number is between 30 and 45, I would consider that kidney abnormal kidney function, okay? Again, if you're, if you're 70, 80, or 90, and you're 45 to 60, I would not be worrying much about your kidney number, unless you've got protein in the urine, which we're gonna discuss in a minute. So, uh, and, and whenever you're getting a kidney number, make sure that you're not sick, make sure uh, that it's repeated a couple times. Different labs can have different methods of doing your serum creatinine and getting the number. So. And there's also different equations. I'm not going to complicate the discussion tonight about all the equations. So, you know, depending on where you get it, if you get it in a different place, different lab, uh, the numbers may not be comparable. So just understand that. Yeah, and it kind of a point there. There was one point where I got my GFR done twice in one day, once at the hospital and once through my uh, primary care physician who sends it off to a lab. And the results came back. And I think it was four points different, same day, well, James, different labs. I, I, just, I just learned this. And actually, there's not a lot of studies on this, but your kidney function will vary in, in a 24-hour period. 
And what you, what you, so that was not necessarily the lab's variance. It could be physiological variance of kidney function. It could vary depending on time of day. So there's uh-huh. a lot of things, a lot of variation in that kidney number. Let's focus a little bit for the moment on urine protein. Because when you're staging kidney function, in the latest staging, uh, they uh, stage them G1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Um, and um, they also stage the protein, which is probably more important, in my opinion, than your kidney number. Because high protein also predicts bad outcomes from atherosclerosis. And you can have a kidney number that is 60 to 90 and have a good bit of protein in the urine, and you got a problem because the protein has uh, serious prediction uh, consequences. In other words, it, but also like, like kidney number, it depends on the amount of protein in the urine. So there's three groupings of the protein. And we've got people from outside the United States, and I'm going to talk to you about the different units, which are confusing. Because we talk about the protein, urine albumin is the protein we talk about in um, milligrams of albumin uh, per gram of creatinine in the urine. And the three uh, categories of protein in the urine are A1, A2, and A3. A1 is less than 30, which I consider normal. A2 is 30 to under 300. That's milligrams of urine al- of albumin in the urine. And stay, A3 is over 300. If you're over 300 consistently, that to me, and that's a very, very, very small percentage of people with kidney disease. And primarily, and the people that wind up with uh, stage four and five, a much higher rate of having uh, 300 or more in the urine. Now, 300 milligrams uh, per gram of creatinine, if you are outside of the US, they measure it in milligrams per millimole. All you gotta do is divide the US value by 10. So we talk about 30, for you it would be around three. Okay, so and if and if we have 300, it would be around 30 in your milligrams per millimole. I know that's confusing, but you guys need to know that there's a difference in the units outside of the United States. So the risk of the atherosclerotic complications goes up with higher urine protein, lower kidney number higher urine protein, those are the main factors that will affect your outcome in terms of hardening of the arteries or whether or not your kidney function is going to decline over time. And we're gonna get, in a few more minutes, we're gonna talk about what I call a chapter in the book, my book, looking into the crystal ball. Everybody wants to know, am I gonna wind up on dialysis? Mm-hmm. And I'll talk, I'm gonna to talk to you about that in a few more minutes. Um, you have any questions for me, James, before I move on? So one question that came up here, when we were talking about the GFR, what if a person only has one kidney? Does that impact the GFR calculation? No, it doesn't affect the calculation at all. But here's something to know. If you or anyone that you know is in a situation to get a kidney transplant, if you have the opportunity to donate a kidney, the reason why we can take one of your kidneys is because the, the, the remaining kidney will increase almost to the function of two kidneys. So kidneys that are normal have a reserve of function. And that's something people don't think about. I mean, we have your kidney number, but you got a reserve. If, if your kidney function number is not very low, it can move up or down depending upon the demands made on your kidney. But no, one kidney will not affect um, the EGFR number. Now, now another question, um, protein leakage is very important. And I think it's something a lot of us don't really understand. So it's great to hear about it. 
what are ways that we can improve protein leakage? Right. Well, the the primary way to decrease the protein in the urine is through medication. And the medication, and we talked about this in a couple of our other discussions, uh, are the drugs called the ACEs, uh, which end in a prill, like haptopril, or the ARBs, and they end in TAN, like losartan. Those are the primary drugs. There are other drugs that are being looked at, and that is something we're going to talk about in another one of our discussions. And there are some new drugs for diabetes that have great potential to not only decrease the protein that you're spilling and help you control your diabetes, but can also slow the decline of kidney function. And in general, if you got a medication, whether it's the ACEs or the ARBs or some of these new diabetes medicines that decreases the protein that you're spilling, that will correlate to having a slower loss of kidney function. So that's something that, that we try to shoot for with people that have especially over 300 uh, milligrams of, of protein or albumin per gram of creatinine. So um, let's just, so that's stage three, A and B. So I would say 3B is kidney disease for everybody. That would be 30 to 45. Stage four is 15 to 30. And, and that is something that is, deserves a whole conversation about. Stage four is when you may develop symptoms that we'll talk about. So if you have stage three or stage one or two, Stage one, again, over 90, stage two, 60 to 89. I don't consider them to really be stages uh, unless you've got protein in the urine, significant amount of protein in the urine. Let's talk about stage five for a minute. If you go online and DeVita says this, if you have stage five, which is also called kidney failure, and I hate that term because it is so, so upsetting and confusing and it's not. It sounds like your kidneys have stopped working completely. And this you is what go you, in life support. And this is what you get online. It says you have lost nearly all of your function. And uh, eventually you will need dialysis or transplant to live. BS. BS. Not true. If you are a young person and you have stage five, yes, very likely that at some point in time you may need a kidney transplant or dialysis. If you are an older person, much, much, much less likely that that is going to be the case, that you will need dialysis or transplant. And we'll talk about this a little bit when I discuss looking into the crystal ball chapter of my book in just a second. So don't think about stage five, especially if you're an older folk, and I'm talking about 78 or 90, certainly when you're in your 80s and 90s, most stage five, you're not gonna wind up on dialysis if your dialysis is timed appropriately. Unfortunately, and this is what reason to look at my book, I discussed this extensively. Many, many people are being put on dialysis way too early, way, way too early at 15 or even over 15, not necessary. I didn't tell you this, James, there's a fellow who's in Italy who's writing a book about the dialysis industry. And he's interviewed hundreds of patients and he's interviewing me now. And um, he's, he's, he's going to have an uphill battle work. fighting the dialysis industry. Well, this is going to be an interesting, and, and it, it, it may eventually be a, a, a documentary. So um, anyone, I strongly urge anyone to have with kidney disease, look at my book especially if you are in that 15 range uh, and you, uh, or anywhere around that range, don't let anyone put you on dialysis too early because we are doing that. And it is no benefit and it may well be harmful. My research has shown yeah. that it may be harmful. Okay. Yeah, I'm putting a lot um, more stress but, on your heart for what could be years earlier than necessary. Yeah. Yeah, and look, for older folks, 
one of my main reasons for writing the book is I have seen too many old folks that went on dialysis unnecessarily and had a really unpleasant, unnecessary unpleasant uh, end of life experience. So please look at that. And, uh, and I, I've, I've asked, James had me discuss when is right, when is the right time for dialysis? One of our, one of our dad advice TV episodes. Yep. Again, no foods to heal the kidney. Just eat healthy to decrease your atherosclerosis. Control your blood pressure. Control your diabetes. Get rid of those cigarettes. Bad, bad for the heart. And um, and watch out regarding uh, taking um, too many of those um, NSAIDs, the ibuprofen. Oh, don't yeah don't, that uh, that don't got me too much of that. Yeah. Um, so the the thing that's probably more important than any individual measure of kidney function is the measures of kidney function over years and that produces what I call I've got a lot of research on this renal function trajectory how fast is your kidney function declining it's not what your kidney number is but where it's going and uh, and that gets into the crystal ball chapter so normally people lose less than a unit a year of kidney function uh, people that wind up going on dialysis lose, on average, at least five units a year. They lose their kidney function pretty rapidly. So when we go into chapter six of my book and the crystal ball chapter, we talk about who may need dialysis. And I saw this uh, someone, a young person who uh, I think has stage five, 38. And uh, yeah, so you have stage five and you're 38 you are likely going to need to look into the, and I discuss this in detail in my book, your options. <clears throat> and the best option for you <clears throat> would be to get a, a li living donor to get a, a living related transplant. And the next best option would be home dialysis. But we're not gonna get into that tonight. Um, but if you are an older folk, certainly if you're in your 80s and 90s, or even maybe in your 70s, and you've got CKD4 uh, or 5, especially if you have CKD5, it, or, or 4, it's much more likely that you will die of a non-kidney failure reason. So by and large, the likelihood, looking into the crystal ball, that you're going to need dialysis, with advancing age, it goes down. As long as you don't get somebody like I have seen, who will put, put you on the machine unnecessarily at 15 or more, please don't let that happen. And if you, if you get into that situation, please look at my book, discuss my information in the book with your physician before you consent. I'm not saying you should never consent to dialysis at that high level, because there are unusual situations, especially people with advanced heart failure, that may have to go on at higher levels of kidney function. But if you're a younger person, the likelihood of you needing dialysis is gonna go up when you have stage four or five, absolutely. And the biggest predictor is your urine protein. The higher your urine protein, the more likely that dialysis is in your future. But if you're like age 70 and you have stage three, one out of four of you will have stage the same kidney number for 10 years, 10 years. So it's not, doom and gloom. And if you even have stage four, um, one out of three of you may stay the same number for at least two years. So it's not something that is going to mean short term needing dialysis, and especially if dialysis is not started too early. My chapter six will talk about two prediction equations that you can discuss with your kidney doctor which will tell you the likelihood that you're gonna go on dialysis. It's called the kidney failure risk equation, KFRE. And then there's another equation and there's a, a website that you can get online. I'm not gonna give it to you if you, well, I, I'll give it. It's called ckdpcrisk.org. If you are stage four, this website will you go, do it with your doctor. You plug in whether you smoke, what your blood pressure is, whether you're diabetic, what your age is, 
and how much protein in the urine. And it will tell you realistically what's going to happen in the future, you know, in the next two to five years. Are you going to likely need dialysis or it's much more likely that you'll die of a non-kidney failure related issue? So uh, those are a couple of things you can do to, uh, to look into the crystal ball and, and look at that chapter and discuss that information with your, with your kidney specialist. If Very you want, good we there. can move into symptoms. <laughs> yeah, let me see. There were a few yeah, questions okay. or comments that I wanted to highlight. Um, one of them, Sal here. I like your doctor, Sal. I think your doctor's got the right uh, the attitude. He, he pretty much told Sal, you're going to die of something else before your kidneys go. And that's usually what we see. And it is heart issues. Let, let, so, me, let me tell yeah. you a funny story. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> this, this is a Dr. Rowe story. So I had a patient in my clinic, a sweet old guy, in my kidney clinic, and he had advanced, very advanced lung disease. I mean, this guy uh, was, um, you know, really sick from his lung disease. But he also had, I, I don't know if it was stage four or five, I can't remember. He had advanced kidney disease. And I told his wife, what you just said, James, that it's much more likely that you're going to... I say, you don't have to worry about kidney failure. You're going to die of your lung disease before you ever have to worry about kidney failure. And somehow that got back to me that the, the wife of this patient talked to somebody else who I knew who talked about that doctor who said this in the clinic. <laughs> but it's real. I mean, it's I just told it like it is. You yeah, know? It, it's something else that will get us and our kidneys, if they're going bad, we just need to really, really focus on our overall health. Yeah. Now, now Gladys had asked, um, "What is osteo?" I'm gonna, I'm, I'm not gonna butcher that word. It's right there on the screen for you. Yeah, <laughs> I know what Oste it is. Hardening of the yeah. arteries, right? No, no, osteoarthritis. Oh. I think she put up. No, but that's not. Are you oh, talking no. about atherosclerosis? No. So. We're not talking about osteoarthritis, that has to do with bones, that has to do with your joints. Ah. We're talking about atherosclerosis, which is hardening of the arteries, which is the buildup of the cholesterol plaque on your arteries, narrowing of the arteries. When the arteries get real narrow, they can close off, like you can have a heart attack when the arteries to the heart close off. You can have decreased blood supply to the brain, you can get strokes if the arteries of the brain close off. So this is what you, you, you have to be concerned about. And especially in diabetics, you may have decreased blood flow to your limbs, to your feet, and you could potentially lose toes or even um, have amputations of your foot or leg. So these, this is the progression of hardening of the arteries. It's, it results in decreased blood flow to the heart, which can give you heart attacks, can give you heart failure, to the brain, which can give you strokes, and to the extremities, which can lead to amputations. And that's what you're trying to prevent. You're trying to prevent these cardiovascular risk uh, problems, heart and blood vessel problems that are the main reason to know you got kidney disease and change the lifestyle. Take on the diet, get rid of smoking, control your weight. Exercise. You know, that's what you're trying to do. Exercise, exercise, absolutely. James, uh, thank you. I, I should put exercise at the top of the list because it is extremely important whether you're diabetic or not, especially if you're diabetic, exercise can actually cure. Exercise and weight loss can cure diabetes. That would be yeah, I'll tell you, right before this call, about 10 minutes before you and I got on here, my <clears throat> primary care physician called me for a quick checkup and <laughs> he had me get on the scale and all those things while on FaceTime, and he had me do some exercise, you know, burnt bending, touching my toes. He wanted to see it all. Uh, I even showed him quickly, look, here's the treadmill that I've been assembling all morning. Yeah. I am getting my exercise because that is so, so important to get, you know, be active. And it doesn't have to be strenuous exercise. All right, let me, uh, let me ask you a couple of questions before I get into symptoms. We only got yep. 10 minutes. But, um, <clears throat> Supplements, forget them, useless, don't waste your money. Supplements have no place in the treatment of kidney disease. They are a waste of money. Black beans, peas, lentils, great. Eat as much of those plant-based diet as you can. They're great. <clears throat> Try to stay away from the red meat as far as you can. Eat more fish. And um, uh, 
CKD, yeah, CKD is 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 it inflammatory? That's a great question. Mm -hmm. um, uh, there, there, okay, there are inflammatory components to CKD, but it's not in and of itself a, a, okay, CKD is chronic kidney disease. By and large, chronic kidney disease has major causes that are related to your blood pressure, related to being diabetic, and related to things that we call idiopathic, means we don't really know what caused it. It could be genetic. <clears throat> so most of these diseases are not inflammatory, but there are some that are. And as far as how bad kidney disease still be reversed, that's gonna be another talk. But you can have something called acute kidney injury, and that's another thing that confuses EGFR. Mm -hmm. You may have a fever, you may be vomiting, you may have diarrhea, you may be sick. That kidney number is useless. You may be at bed rest, you may be in the hospital. The kidney number is useless. You gotta get back to your baseline stable function for the kidney number to have meaning. Because your kidney number can look really scary when you get in a hospital. Because if you've already got, let's say, CKD3B, let's say you're 45 or something like that, uh, or you're 35, um, your kidney number may go down to 15 or 20 when you got sick. But it may because you got dehydrated. But it can, exactly. It can, it so can, many times we get it, sick, we're dehydrated. Yeah, we, but it can come back. That's the commonest reason for reversible decline of kidney function is dehydration, being sick, having fever, vomiting, having low blood pressure, all of those things can cause your kidney function to look terrible, but it can get better. What's the dangerous protein in the urine? By and large, as we said, the most advanced stage is over 300 milligrams per gram of creatinine. And 300 um, is really not a lot. I mean, in my experience as a kidney doctor, but that's when you start getting, you know, concerned, really concerned. I've seen people that have 3,000 or 6,000 <sighs> with, with varying types of advanced kidney disease. Ooh. But over 300 a, is definitely to be concerned. I have a question I want to ask you. Yeah. So we talked about acute kidney injury, which can recover. Can a person have CKD and acute kidney injury? Absolutely, James. That's one of the most common situations for a patient who's already got some abnormal kidney number. And like I said, they go in the hospital. And here's something that I really want to warn you about. Let's say you got stage four. Your number is 20. You go in the hospital, your number is 10. Kidney number is 10. GFR is 10. They may put you on a machine and you mm -hmm. didn't need it because it was reversible. And as I talked about in some of our discussions, your kidney doctor does not look for reversible recovery of kidney function once you're on dialysis because it becomes a little bit tricky to look for it and it's not the standard. So if you have one of these situations where you went from you know, 30 down to 10 or you went from 40 down to 10, make sure you ask your doctor, that's what you call acute on chronic kidney disease, James, that's what it's called. Yep. Make sure you ask your kidney doctor if this is a reversible situation, because it might be. And even if they say no, because I asked mine, is this reversible? Like, no, GFR 13 is as good as you're gonna get. They wanted to, to put an access in my neck. Yeah, yeah, and I yeah. was against that. I agreed, hey, look, I'm gonna come every day, we'll get labs. If my GFR goes back down to 10, then we can put it in access. Give me a chance to see what I can do. I will stop doing all the bad stuff. And I, I believe, I have no hard evidence, but I believe I had acute kidney injury on top of CKD. Mm -hmm. And that's what allowed me to relatively quickly, it took about a year and a half, get my kidney function up. Yeah. But I focused on my overall health. Yeah, is what I did. Yeah. Protecting my heart. That's really what everything was. Protect your heart. You got to lose weight. You got to be more active. Everything else will fall in line. And I didn't believe it at first, but that's exactly yeah. what happened. And and you will see in my book that James just said, if I went down to 10, you could put me on. The best time for most people is somewhere closer to five, James. And we're putting people on dialysis 
at over 10 and over 15, please read my book. And don't go on the dialysis machine without at least considering some of the research that I've done and my colleagues have done, which have shown better outcomes for patients that are started on dialysis at levels around five or six or less. So uh, in the remaining minutes, so we'll yeah, we've only got a few minutes left. You want to maybe do, leave that for another talk. Uh, could you touch on some of the symptoms that we need to worry about? If you're having this symptom, it is something serious. Um, and maybe the very first one, which is so much confusion, bubbles in the urine. Okay. So uh, we talked about urine protein, and that's not the only thing that can get. But if you have foamy urine consistently, it may mean you got protein in the urine. And that's an easy thing to dis to detect when you go to your doctor. They could do what they call a urine dipstick. They could just put a, uh, a you know a little strip in your urine and find out if you got urine protein. Um, <clears throat> by and large, you're not going to have symptoms. And people on the when I'm on the Facebook pages of kidney you know support groups, you don't get symptoms with stage three. It is extremely rare. Not impossible, but rare. 3B, maybe. 3B, which is, again, 30 to 45. As you get closer to 30, you may have trouble with your blood count. You may have anemia. And that will produce the majority of symptoms that relate to kidney disease is progressive decline in your blood count. And that can give you shortness of breath. That can make you feel weak. Um, and that can actually affect your heart function. The other uh, symptom, which again is not common until you get probably to stage five. If you have decreased appetite, nausea and vomiting, it's probably another reason unless you're already down to stage five, less than 15. So by and large, very few symptoms most people with advanced kidney disease will get elevated blood pressure. If you've got a lot of protein in the urine, you may get swelling of your ankles. You may get puffy mm -hmm. eyes. Um, with advanced kidney disease, you may have worsening of your heart function. You may get erectile dysfunction with advanced kidney disease. It could also be related to your medications. There are other things that happen with very low kidney function. So again, symptoms are extremely rare. Don't expect to be having symptoms, especially with stage three and even, um, you know, stage four, you may or may not have any symptoms. The most common one will relate to low blood count anemia. So the most common incorrect symptom I see online, someone's newly diagnosed, stage two, very high GFR, and they say their back hurts. Can you talk about that? Nothing. Your kidneys will not have, there's no pain. It's another one, like blood pressure, it's a silent uh, problem. You have no pain. Your kidneys will not give you pain. The only situation, which is rare, is a, is a disease called polycystic kidney disease, which runs in families. Your kidneys can get real big, I mean extremely big, can give you pain in your back, pain in your stomach in your belly. Very rare. Kidney disease, by and large, no symptoms, no pain until it gets very advanced. Very good. All right. We are at the top of our hour. <laughs> that was an awesome chat, Dr. Rowe. So I'd like to ask everyone, please subscribe. If you haven't done so, hop on over to YouTube and subscribe to the Dadvice TV channel. That way, when I schedule upcoming shows like today's, you'll get a notification. And if you are interested about learning more about the things Dr. Rowe has talked about, his book, Learn the Facts About Kidney Disease, available on Amazon. I have a short link right here that'll take you right to it. Go.dadvicetv.com slash book. It is a great book. If I was going to write one, what he put in his book is pretty much the same things I would say, except he has a whole lot more experience and leans on that. It is an easy, easy read. And, you know, to me, I, I've got it all marked up. I've got a, a, a thing in here. I still go back to it. Even before today's show, I was like, what? I remember 
I liked how you described the stages and I looked in here and you mentioned how you disagree with them because they cause unnecessary worry, which is exactly what we're here to talk about today. It's not as bad as it seems when you go out to the to the big kidney sites and you're like, whoa, I'm stage three, what's next? Oh, it says stage four, which is get ready for dialysis. And as soon as I hit that GFR 15, I'm on a machine. No, it's not like that. And Gladys saying, where can I get the book? I'll bring that link right back up here. Uh, you can get it on Amazon. You can also call or visit your local bookstores. It would be great to give some business yeah to your local small businesses, give them a call and say, hey, can you order this book, Learn the Facts About Kidney Disease by Dr. Steven Rosansky. And that would be great for them, you know, and it's great for yourself. All right, everybody, I wanna thank you for being here. I'll be back again tomorrow night. We've got two more shows this week as we are approaching the Christmas holiday. And then I'm again, I'm back here next week. We're not taking any time <laughs> off. Luckily, no shows fall right on the holiday. <laughs> and thank you so much, Dr. Rowe, for being here. Always a pleasure. Always so helpful. And the biggest takeaway, whenever we talk to you, stress gets relieved. We hear about what it's really like. It's not all doom and gloom. Uh, thank you so much for that. And I can't wait till you get your next book how's it coming as a matter of fact how is how's your next book slow slow slog slow slog <laughs> well at don't least don't recommend it's on its writing way. a book it's hard <laughs> <laughs> but we will would... talk about we'll talk about some of the stuff on your shows it's going to be focused on diabetes we'll talk awesome. about oh yes it's a huge one huge yeah. huge one for everyone yeah. all right thank you so much everybody out there have a great rest of the week. I'll see you, those of you that make it tomorrow during the live show um, with Jen Hernandez, renal dietitian. And then on Wednesday, we have Dr. Butt. All sorts of great stuff this week. All right, everybody. See you later. Bye.